Michael Jackson was no ordinary performer. In life, he was destined to make a difference, destined to become an international superstar, and in death, destined to leave behind many troubling, unanswered questions. Yes, sir. I need to. Uh, I need an ambulance as soon as possible, sir. Okay, sir. What's your address? It's 100 North Carrollwood Drive, Los Angeles, California, 90077. Is it Carrollwood? Carrollwood Drive, yes. On June 25th, 2009, the Los Angeles Fire Department responded to the 100 block of Carrollwood at 12, 21, and 18 seconds. Unfortunately, at the time, the dispatcher answered the phone call and, and never once did the caller ever identify to the Los Angeles Fire Department that the person that needed our help was Michael Jackson. And what's the problem exactly what happened? Uh, sir, I have a, we have a, a gentleman here that needs help and he's not breathing yet. He's not breathing and we need to, we're trying to pump him, but he's not, he's okay. not. Okay, okay, how old is he? He's uh, 50 years old, sir. 50, okay. He's unconscious, he's not breathing? Yes, he's not breathing, sir. Okay, and he's not conscious either? He's not no, he's breathing. not conscious, sir. Okay. All right, do you have him? Is he on the floor? Where's he at right now? He's on the bed, sir. He's on the bed. Okay, let's get him on the floor. Okay. Okay, let's get him down to the floor. I'm going to help you with CPR right now, okay? When our paramedic heard that it was being, CPR was being conducted on the bed, gave explicit, direct, emphatic direction for that patient to be moved from the bed and CPR to be done on the ground. Okay. Okay, let's get him down to the floor. I'm gonna help you with CPR right now, okay? We need him to get, we need a Yes, we're already on our way there. We're on our way. I'm gonna do as Thank much you, I can to help you over the phone. We're already on our way. Did anybody see him? Yes, we have a personal doctor here with him, sir. Oh, you have a doctor there? Dr. Murray said that he would take full responsibility for the patient. What that does for us is that now the doctor becomes the highest level of a medical authority. If he would have denied, we would have asked him to step aside and the paramedics would have been the highest medical authority to give care to Michael Jackson. He's not responding to anything, to no, no, he's not responding to CPR or anything. So. Oh, okay. Well, we're on our way there. If your guys are doing CPR and you're instructed by doctor, he has a higher authority than me. And he's Thank there you. on scene. Okay. Um, was, did anybody witness what happened? Uh, no, just the doctor, sir. The doctor's been the only one here. Okay, so did the doctor see what happened? Uh, um, doctor, did you see what happened, sir? And, sir, you just, uh, um, if you can please. Uh, oh, yeah, we're on our way. We're on our way. The question is, why did it take Dr. Murray so long to dial 911? Only Dr. Murray can answer that question. Obviously, fast response saved lives. Why Dr. Murray took so long, and whoever long uh, he noticed that Michael Jackson was down, it's unexplainable to us. I'm just, I'm just passing these questions on to my uh, paramedics while they're on the way there, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, he's pumping, he's pumping his chest, but he's not responding to anything, sir. Please. Okay, okay. We're on our way. We worked 45 minutes because, as paramedics, we call it the golden hour. Obviously, we try to tell the community when someone is pulseless and non-breathing, you call 911 immediately, wherever you live. We're less than a mile away. We'll be there shortly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Call us back right. if you need Thank you. Yes, sir. I don't like to throw any doctor under the bus, but the more that comes out, the harder it is to defend. I, I, I'll put it this way. I, I, would, I think it's going to be very difficult for his attorney to find a, a medical doctor to serve as a professional witness or an expert witness to support what was done in that house. To me, it's indefensible. The singer Michael Jackson is reported to have died about three hours ago. He was not breathing when paramedics arrived. They performed heart massage. And then they took him to the UCLA Medical Center in the city, where he's said to have gone into a deep coma. He was pronounced dead a short time ago. The singer had been due in London for a series of concerts during the summer. The LAPD and the district attorney are both looking at the question of whether to file charges here. The betting is that a manslaughter charge will come down against Dr. Conrad Murray. 
Because of all that is going on, I am afraid to return phone calls or use my email. Therefore, I recorded this video to let all of you know that I have been receiving your messages. Michael Jackson's dramatic departure is more than just a death. It involves the towering legacy he left behind, amounting to billions of dollars. You have people saying that Michael Jackson was murdered. There are people saying he was corporately murdered. It's a big thing about corporate. There was people after his catalogue. I mean, I wouldn't go into details of who I thought it was, but I remember speaking to his mum, and it was underlined that, you know, if you get rid of him, you can benefit from the branding, the estate, the publishing, the product. Money is going to be coming in, and I think there are going to be demands on that money. But I think ultimately, um, you will find Michael Jackson is going to be worth more in death than he is in life. So you got this company called AEG, which couldn't give a fuck whether or not he lives or dies. And if I was going to investigate something, I would investigate them. What insurance did they have? Who owns those films that they're putting out of Michael Jackson's performances? First off, why would they film the rehearsals? That's not normal behavior. So obviously you're filming the rehearsals to do what? Why, why would you waste the time? You know, they're putting out this film, I don't know, but I'll bet, you know, and I lose bets, but I would bet that there are a lot of um, other people performing as Michael Jackson. I've worked for Michael as a decoy since 1993, and I can't go into details, but I've worked for him over the years, um, even to the point where I got a call to do the visuals for the This Is It concert, um, that obviously didn't materialize. If you study Michael Jackson like I've studied him, I've studied him more than probably family members know him. And I can tell you Michael Jackson by the way he points, the way he moves, I can, t I can tell you certain visuals of scenes of the show that's not Michael Jackson. There is nothing in and around Michael Jackson that will not be commercialized or exploited. It certainly started long before Michael Jackson. Think of Marilyn Monroe. It never ends for people who die young and unexpectedly, and certainly Michael Jackson is one. So they're gonna film Michael Jackson doing rehearsals when they don't know what hour he's showing up, so I'm gonna have a whole film crew here in L.A. Uh, uh there's something else that went on. Michael Jackson's sudden departure was perhaps the most shocking celebrity demise since his friend Princess Diana was killed in a 1997 car crash. This has been the Jackson family home ever since they moved to Los Angeles from small town Indiana back in the spring of 1971. It's here that plans were made and successes were celebrated. Now, of course, it's a place of mourning for his immediate family, all of whom survive him. The family is there to support me and I'm here to support them as well, so it helps a little, but it's a hard and a big pill to swallow. I'm his brother, but I'm his fan. I hurt the way they hurt because here's someone who they could communicate with. He was here to do a job. Through his music and through his actions and through his charitable work and going to hospitals and, and, and bringing just enlightenment and wonderment to children who were dying and paying for, paying for people who were just could, couldn't afford to, to pay for their, their, their services. I, I mean, he reached out. He's the number one donor of, of just charity around the globe. The world was left stunned and perplexed by Michael's unexpected demise. It's still uh, surrealistic to me. Very surrealistic. I can't. I can't, I can't get my arms around it. It's not real. Google crashed because it was just how big this man was. It was like the world paused. Everybody felt a connection, whether you liked him or not. What does it mean to you personally? I was 50, I was his age when I produced Thriller. You know, and it's just not real. And I was here when he sold out the concerts, 50 again. 
in four hours. Remember that. The last time I spoke to him. When was the last time you spoke to him? Here, when he finished sold out the four con 50 concerts in four hours. He was going to bring the kids over when I had a dinner with Bucky Gatesman. And uh, I told him I'll see him in Los Angeles. So that's the way it works. My reaction is um, utter shock. I, I, I want this to be a bad horror dream, but it's not. I'm just devastated. What, is, what does it mean to you personally? Because you, what does it mean to you personally? Because you need to be personally, man. Jesus Christ. You answer that question. Guys, we're late for our flight. We do four I'm albums in the Wheel of the World. We do, you know. Have you spoken to the family? It's like, it is. It's like my big brother. It's part of my soul goes for this. It does. It's a, it's a very close relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But you won't be going to the funeral. What? No, I'm not going to the funeral. Because I don't want to go to most of them. Ray Charles, Brandon, it's enough. You know, I don't want to see people in that shape. Marvin Gaye, it's enough. 150 people in two and a half years. It's enough. I want to remember the way they were. Okay, that we cold, we not true. Yeah. Thanks for your time. God you. bless, man. Okay, Thank, you. Thank you. I am somewhat numb. I am shocked at the passing of Michael Jackson. You know, it's uh, like a dream, bad dream. He was so much like a son to me. Uh, it's just hard to realize that Michael Jackson is not here. Unless you are a fan of Michael Jackson in the way that so many millions of people are, and the way that I am, you. You can't begin to understand the loss that we're feeling. Just shocked, really. It just, I mean, I spoke to him last week. I mean, he was on really good form. Um, so confident, positive. It's, it's, I, it's, I'm absolutely stunned by this. Ever since I was born, Daddy has been the best father you could ever imagine. Since Michael Jackson has been laid to rest in a star-studded memorial service, the saga surrounding his demise is far from over. Even in death, the King of Pop is surrounded in mystery and controversy. His dramatic exit left the world awash with conspiracy theories and speculation. If, as the leaked autopsy reports, if they are accurate, if they, they say he was eight stone one ounce. This doesn't look like a particularly gaunt man. No. You would be able to tell from the size of his thighs. And this picture here, I don't know whether you can just see that, that's quite a small one here, but you can see in profile, he has a healthy looking face, even with that slight, as we all have, under our chins, a little bit of flesh there under the chin, that necessarily wouldn't be there if he was an anorexic skeleton. Michael, just an ordinary guy. I mean, probably 99% that's written about Michael is untrue, apart from putting his spacesuit on when he went to bed. 99.9% .9 of what's written about him is was false. There's just so much. I read that his his nose went missing. I think it was in the Daily Mirror. That's, I mean, that's absolutely crazy. But I think what it is is that perhaps there's an ounce of truth in what's written, but it's totally embellished. There are no conspiracy theories. There's truth. 
he murdered himself. He knew what he was doing. He wanted to die. He couldn't be who he once was. Who he once was was no longer relevant. He orchestrated the entire death, and he was able to die a god. There's absolutely no way that Michael would have taken his life. No way. I can, I can bet my life on that, no way. He had so much going for him. He wouldn't have done it, A, for his children, which meant everything to him. He, he, there's no question that, that Michael would ever have ever have, have killed himself. They said that Michael Jackson faked his death. Why fake your death when you can create your world? To say that Michael faked his own death is absolutely ridiculous. I wish it were true, because he'd still be here, wouldn't he? Within hours of his death from cardiac arrest, police became suspicious about the coterie of doctors who provided Jackson with a steady supply of prescription drugs. Dr. Conrad Murray he didn't intend to kill Michael Jackson, yet he was so reckless or grossly negligent in administering those drugs that it does constitute manslaughter. They're talking about manslaughter. I wasn't surprised, for goodness sake. I mean, Matt and I saw things that just simply were beyond ethics. You're basically taking care of the most famous person on the planet. That's a lot of pressure. So if that person is asking you for uh, drugs, I, there's going to be tremendous pressure to, to do what, what Michael Jackson so, you know, asked you to do. But at the same time, as a doctor, as a physician, you have to have the, the wherewithal to say, you know, this is too much, this is not good for you, withhold it, give him some alternatives. There are a lot of alternatives for pain management other than giving people pain pills. I think whether Michael requested whatever drugs they said he had or they were given to him, I think doctors should be held accountable as a professional to have not put anyone in this position. I never saw Michael take even an aspirin when he was with me. Uh, I was absolutely horrified when I found out and the circumstances of his death, um, which became clear in the news. When I was with him and our families were together, he was always bright, alert, and there was never any question of him being on anything. The first time that I was, that it was actually brought to my attention was in March 2009, when I was at the Landsborough Hotel, and um, he requested that I get hold of some medication for him through my family contact, because I've got six members of my family in the medical field. I have an aunt who is an anesthesiologist who could give Diprovan. My mum's a pain management nurse, get hold of any painkillers. My brother's a dentist and specialises in pain management again and then my cousin's a pharmacist. So these are really key people that could 100% supply Michael. I was questioned by the LAPD because I had witnessed various things in March 2009 and they wanted to get a bigger picture of what I'd seen, who was there, and the various drugs that I had actually seen in Michael's bathroom. And obviously by virtue of the fact that I'd known him for 11 years, they wanted to, to know if there was anything that I knew. I did get death threats uh, the day before I went to speak to the police and I have had threats um, immediately afterwards. The LAPD were aware of it, the FBI were aware of all threats being made to me. And no one came to him and said, you know something, Michael, we're going to put you out. No, he went to these people and he said, Doc, I don't feel well. Or, Doc, how much do you need? Give me scripts. He asked those doctors to actually give him liquid so he would become a zombie state because he couldn't sleep? You know, and excuse me, what time of day was he deciding to go to sleep? What frustrates me is we as people don't want to see truth. We should look at his death and learn from his death. What went wrong here? If we want Michael Jackson's life to have some meaning, we should focus on this evil called these doctors and stop them. On August 28th, 2009, Michael Jackson's death was officially ruled 
as homicide. When most people hear the word homicide, they think murder, but it doesn't mean that. Just because the coroner believes it was a homicide, that means he thinks a human being was involved. It's up to the district attorney to decide whether to seek charges for murder or manslaughter or some other crime. The Los Angeles Police Department criminal investigation focused on Dr. Conrad Murray, Jackson's personal physician, who was at his bedside the day he died. He was a cardiologist, uh, certainly uh, not qualified to, to handle Michael Jackson's pain management. I'll, I'll put it that way. Maybe his heart, a heart problem, but, but, but certainly not for pain. I'm not sure why Dr. Murray was giving um, Michael Jackson anesthesia when in this country it would only be an anesthesiologist that could do that. You know, medication that was used that shouldn't have been used, um, unsupervised. Um, that kind of medication is only used in hospitals, as far as I know. And um, he should have been on some kind of monitor, but he shouldn't have been given it in the first place. Dr. Murray was employed by concert promoter AEG Live only 11 days prior to Jackson's death. By the way, isn't it interesting? He hires a doctor from Texas, and Texas has a medical malpractice laws that limits the amount of money you could get from malpractice. He who pays the piper calls the tune, and if Michael wanted that, he'd find someone who'd pay him enough to do it. Half a million pounds he offered me to obtain medication. I want to really clarify this, because it's got kind of mixed up in the media. He asked for propofol, which is a form of anesthesia that's given in surgery. That is not something that you take at home. It's something that you need a qualified anesthesiologist to administer. The official cause of Michael Jackson's death was acute propofol intoxication. Vials of propofol, also known as Diprovan, along with an IV stand, were found in Jackson's Holmby Hills mansion after his death. Jackson referred to the drug as his milk and used it to help with his chronic insomnia. Diprovan is not a narcotic, but it is a very potent medication to put people to sleep. Normally used in an operating room, I've never seen Diprovan at somebody's house. This medication, uh, joke, about, joke about the OR, calling it milk of amnesia because it's white. You give it to someone IV and they go to sleep a matter, within a matter of seconds. You're really asking for uh, a state of unconsciousness that may or may not result in uh, the ability to resuscitate. You can have a person that's been on narcotics for several years. They can take a huge dose of it and, and perform as if they weren't on anything. When you use these medications, it's a chronic, it's an everyday thing. I think if he wasn't on the medication, he wouldn't even been there for rehearsal. I've, I've had patients that's come to me on four and five grams, not milligrams, but grams of morphine a day and they can walk, talk, look normal because their body has built up a tolerance to it. It's so dangerous and a patient needs to be monitored while they're on it so it's not something you can self-administer. I warned him many times. I shouted at him on several occasions and I actually told him verbally, Michael, this will kill you. Michael, you will die. Michael always said that he could handle it. Our worst nightmare was that he could not, that there would be an overdose. Jackson family lawyer Brian Oxman says he repeatedly warned Jackson and his family about the drug's problem. The man was in pain, and there was no question about it. He needed to have certain medications, but the problem becomes the overuse of medications, and that's something which people I think all people find very difficult to control. He simply wasn't able to control it. More could have definitely been done to help Michael. I tried my very hardest to, to help Michael. The problem is, and I think it's just one big circle. Whenever you say anything about Michael, no one believes it. I called around just about everybody I possibly could and told them no one believed me. I spoke to some media outlets in the States. For legal reasons, they couldn't do or say anything. Um, and it, it just got to a point that, you know, even if you are telling the truth about Michael, no one would believe it. So therefore, it made it so hard to help him. And if you say anything through the fans, you'll get vilified for saying what the fans deem as bad things about Michael. 
So I was in a catch-22 situation. But I do know at the very same time that I was speaking to some media outlets and various people, Michael's family were doing the same, in particular Joe Jackson. So I know for definite that Joe Jackson and Leonard Rowe were trying to help Michael. Do you know, I'll never forget the day that I had to sleep next to Michael Jackson's bed because we were concerned that someone will come in his room giving something and he simply will not wake up the next morning. I had this problem with Michael. Michael wanted to go to, to London Zoo and see gorillas. So we got ready and he didn't come out of his bedroom. I, I walked into his bedroom and he was lying on the bed and I, I kind of tried to wake him up and, and he wouldn't wake up. So I put my hands over his body and I said, Michael, what's going on? What, what, what did you take? Michael, are you okay? He was not okay. He missed that visit to the zoo. I was surprised that he lived as long as he did. This guy was on serious amount of drugs. The singer was said to be taking three powerful painkillers all at the same time, when more than one could be potentially fatal. He was also consuming vast quantities of pills every day. And when I went into his bathroom, I saw lots and lots of pill boxes um, of various different medication. Um, in there, there was Demerol, there was Paxil, Zoloft. Demerol is a painkiller and Paxil and Zoloft, they're antidepressants. I was absolutely shocked and, you know, when I saw these things in the bathroom, I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, he's, he's a drug addict or anything like that. I was thinking, maybe he's sick and I wanted to know. But I, and I kept on asking him, well, what's happening? And he was like, no, everything's routine, you know, it's all okay. And, um, and that's when I decided to take a few samples. I didn't take the whole lot, I took a few samples of the medication and I took them home so that I'd have time to think carefully and find out what they were. Michael Jackson's daily intake of prescription medication was extensive. Demerol is better known as pethidine, so it's a strong painkiller It's related to morphine. So it will it'll be used as a painkiller. Um, it's unusual for it to be only used twice a day. The list of drugs included some, uh, a few morphine type drugs, some antidepressants and some tranquilizers. The Xanax is, is one that's related to uh, Valium and, and it would have similar effects. Soloft is an antidepressant um, used in this country, known by different names in this country. Ritalin is a stimulant. It's often used in uh, ADHD in children um, and it's similar to an amphetamine or speed. It's a real cocktail. Um, and it's not one that I would uh, expect to see used in treating uh, a normal person, really. Um, but there's two risks. One is that they could become addicted, particularly to the morphine-type drugs and the, the Valium-type drugs. But you're likely to be drowsy. Um, if the real danger is if it's given in too high a dose, mm. particularly the morphine-type drugs. That tends to suppress breathing, uh, and if it's given in too high a dose, it will actually stop someone breathing. That, in turn, can bring on a heart attack. Yes, you could see that sort of combination, but I would expect someone to be closely controlled. I would expect the doses to be very closely controlled. When this information surfaced, those close to Michael were astonished. Michael was very anti-drugs. I mean, he was very much into healthy living. I mean, he was, you know, wanted, you know, he shielded his children particularly from 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 any. You know, he only made sure they only watched um, new films, a lot of Disney stuff, um, and he wouldn't allow them to to um, to be witness to to any kind of substance taking or. I mean, that would just 
No, you've been, he would have been horrified by that. I have a message for the um, medical profession out there freely prescribing drugs. As a doctor, you know, you swear the Hippocratic Oath to do right by your patient. Over-prescribing and misprescribing, you're ruining people's lives, killing people prematurely. It's not just about the money, you've got to think about your patients. The doctors should pull their information and before they get the second dosage, they should be made to go to a doctor and to get a medical clearance to get that dosage again. Make the doctor be a doctor. Don't let him become a drug dealer. Do doctors want to be drug dealers when they start? Just five months after Michael Jackson's death, it was back to business for Dr. Conrad Murray as his Texas-based cardiology practice reopened to treat patients. Brian Oxman, the Jackson family lawyer, claimed the pop superstar was terrified of being murdered for his money and his musical empire. This man owns, you know, 50% of a massive publishing company and he owns the Beatles, right? Michael certainly wasn't naive when it came to questions of business or anything to do with the music industry. He was um, as sharp as a razor. He came back to perform. He didn't come back for a money venture. So, you know, it, it goes to show that whatever they say about him, I don't think they really know the man. He knew every step of the way what he was doing, and he took advantage of everybody. You don't die owing a half a billion dollars. When he was friends with Paul McCartney, he ended up with the Beatle catalog when Paul McCartney thought he was going to buy it. And Paul McCartney is a gentleman, but Michael Jackson abused a relationship. Michael Jackson's sister, LaToya, claimed the singer was murdered by the shadowy entourage who surrounded him. When I left the Lansborough Hotel back in March 2009, one of his minders dropped me off at the station and was trying to pressurize me into supplying drugs for Michael. and. Um, I did feel quite pressurised and it was very uncomfortable. Some of his minders didn't have his best interests at heart or perhaps they felt that they should give Michael whatever he wanted or whatever he thought he wanted. I don't think Michael's controlled in any way. I think anyone that ever tried to control Michael, um, their job probably ended soon after. And if you think about it, the man fired his dad. You know, I mean, what's in the chopping block? I kind of recognised that if I was to stay friends with Michael for any period of time, I'd very much have to take a back seat because I feel that if I'd been more prominent in his life, being seen around with him, I'd have been removed. I think if you get too close to Michael, you're removed. Some of the most important people, some of the people that could have helped Michael in his life and that did have his best interests at heart were removed from his life. Somebody who I feel could have really, really helped Michael was Grace, Michael's nanny. She was extremely loyal to Michael and she cared about Michael. She really, really did. And I feel that it was just a shame that she was let go when she was. Because I think if she had remained in Michael's employment, Michael would be with us today. Michael Jackson spent the last two months of his life rehearsing for a gruelling 50-date residency at London's O2 Arena. But behind the scenes, concerns were growing as the first scheduled shows were postponed. Michael Jackson's announcement of 10 concerts here is certainly a coup for the O2 Arena. And if those concerts go well, the expectation is that he'll add many more dates but questions still remain about whether the Michael Jackson of today can still cut it live on such a big stage. It's a staggering show. That's what Michael Jackson does. And so, therefore, you're talking about absolute... the, the top of, heart, of energy. And he has to be, you know, almost plugged into glucose because that's the only way he's going to get through it. He's going to be back after all these years. What do you think it's going to be like? Do you think he's going to live up to everyone's expectation? Um, I don't know. I mean, either way, everyone's, everyone's just going to be glad to see him back on stage. <laughs> oh! Oh! Do you think 
he's going to be able to cope because he's not as fit as he used to be, is he? How do you know? Check his heart rate. There are conflicting reports as to the true state of Jackson's health in the lead up to the concerts. The last time I saw Michael was at the conference, um, at the O2, and the world's press is there. Do you know, they say he looked high. They say he looked sedated. I would say he looked that he was focused. And they're saying that he was ill, and, and then it came out that he was physically fit. He was really in good shape. Michael Jackson weighed correct for his height. He had the best dietitian that you can get. The last time I saw Michael was in March 2009. And to me, he did look underweight. He did. He looked a lot thinner than I'd ever seen him before. And I don't think he looked particularly healthy. He just seemed frail to me. I don't think it was reasonable to expect somebody of 50 to do 50 concerts in six months. I just think that that's too hard. He just didn't have enough time to prepare for it, you know? And so much was riding on that, and it put an enormous strain on him, enormous strain. And I just don't think it was very fair on him. And I think, in some respects, it was quite irresponsible. Very irresponsible. Just the night before he died, Jackson was here at the Staples Centre in LA, rehearsing for his upcoming London shows. And by all accounts, it was a pretty energetic performance, running through 10 or 11 songs and dances. After which, Jackson's manager says the singer came up and put his arm around him and told him, I am so happy. This is really our time. At these rather less glamorous studios, Jackson had a tough schedule for the last few months. People here who watched him rehearse said he was thin and frail, but he seemed fit. He was, you know, up to par. He was at his best and he was ready to, um, to come back and just wow us all away. He wanted to come back badly in a great way. He was a perfectionist, so he wanted these concerts to be close to perfection. And that creates stress, that creates anxiety. At the time of the concert announcement in March 2009, representatives from promoters AEG Live stated that Jackson had passed a four and a half hour physical examination by independent doctors. And I pulled him aside and said, Mikey, why now? Okay, and he said to me, he said, because you know what, my kids are old enough and I'm still young enough to do what I do. I don't want them to see me, you know, in my prime when I, when I do because they've never seen me before. He was under a lot of pressure from the promoters. He was worked far too hard. All of these things that have come out into the media about Michael being in fantastic health and being as fit as a 20-year-old, that's nonsense. I saw Michael with my own eyes and he wasn't looking fit. He didn't look healthy and he was underweight. So I don't understand how you know, the insurance company had a doctor examine him and the results are that he's as healthy as a 20-year-old. That is not true. I don't think any doctor could say that. Unfortunately, he was surrounded by people who didn't necessarily have his well-being in mind. I remember I once asked him, Michael, are you a lonely man? And he looked up at me and he said, it took him 10 seconds to, to say what he said. And he said, Uri Geller, I'm a very lonely man. There are claims that Michael Jackson had agreed to perform only 10 concerts rather than 50. Those close to him have differing opinions. Michael didn't sign up to do 50 concerts. He said that to me, that he only thought he was doing 10. He kept on saying that. He didn't, he didn't, that's not what he thought he was doing. And it kind of angered him that he was, you know, in some ways forced to do 50 concerts. Well, this is what I can understand, because when I 
I was with Michael when he went when we went to the O2 together. He he phoned me up and said, "Come along, come along. I'm doing this announcement." So I said, "Yeah, sure, okay." So I drove up to London and we went um, in the bus up to the O2 where he was going to announce the. The, the, the dates for the concert and um, he always told me he was doing 50 dates so uh, I, I don't know where him not knowing this came from because he, he was always aware he was going to be doing 50 but it wasn't 50 I, when I first thought 50 dates I mean my god how are you going to do that but it wasn't like they were every night they were you know gaps. Michael Jackson did not think there were 10 concerts for his performances I follow this logically Okay, so they come to you, promoters, all right? And promoters are promoters. So they say, Michael, we're gonna do 10 shows and we need an option for the other 40. So Michael will go, oh, okay. And he'll sign up and he'll do the 10 and he'll give him an option for the other 40. And then Michael needs to believe that he's God and that everyone's gonna pay to see Michael Jackson do the songs and dances that he once did in 1984. He was totally in control, trying to do the impossible. Michael Jackson was very much up for the 50, and Michael Jackson was very much in control of the 50. I'm not picking sides. I know some family members are angry, and I don't want to upset anybody. But my opinion of it is Michael was excited to know that he was that loved, that much in demand, and he, why would he come out of bed for 10? He couldn't perform those shows. That's my instinct. That's my belief. It was like a a child waiting for Christmas with these O2 concerts. I mean, it was absolutely geared up, focused. I've never seen and it, Michael like in that state before, and it was absolutely wonderful. I was really pleased to see him so energised by this. After Michael announced the concerts, he stayed in London, and my family came up, and we spent the weekend with with Michael before he flew back to the States. He was in a really good positive mood. I mean, he was in such a positive frame of mind, best I've seen him for, for a long time. And it was so reassuring and we, you know, we had big plans and he was gonna come to London and you know, it was over the school holidays and the kids were all gonna get together and we had loads of free time and we, we, things we were gonna do and all these plans we had. Uh, he was just so positive. He told me his, his children had never seen him perform. They'd seen obviously video and DVD footage of him f on stage, but they'd haven't never actually seen him live, none of his children. So this was something he not only was doing for his fans, but mainly for his children. Probably no celebrity has been as revered and reviled over the past 40 years as much as Michael Jackson. Since his arrival on the scene in 1963 as the cherubic five-year-old singing phenomenon with his brothers in the teen heartthrob group Jackson 5, he has been at the forefront of pop culture. Michael st started at the age of five, I started at the age of five, so, you know, we were always kind of comparing. Obviously, Michael's fame was sort of infinitely more than mine, but, um, you know, having been in the, in the spotlight at such an early age, and we used to share memories about our early times. He said, you know, when, when these teeny bop magazines came out, ha were in the States, and I don't know if they still exist, there's one called Tiger Beat, I think, and Seventeen, there were four people that used to feature, and one of them was Michael, who obviously dominated. Donny Osmond, uh, David Cassidy, myself, oh, and Jack Wild. So there was five who, not always, but were kind of the ones that were, were shown most in these magazines. And Michael would pick up these magazines, and quite often there would be a page of Michael, and the next page would be me. So he kind of thought there was some, some sort of parallelism between us. He did tell me that he enjoyed the film Oliver and it was his favourite musical and it remained his favourite musical all his life, which was kind of odd coming from Michael who has dominated the pop charts for so long and made so many wonderful records. For him to tell me that this was his favourite musical was something else that was quite an honour really.
The Jackson Five brothers were the eldest sons in a family of nine children, born in Gary, Indiana, to steel worker Joe Jackson and his wife Catherine. Strict disciplinarian Joe recognized his son's talent and molded them into a singing group, one that would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997. I've met Joe a few times. He's the father of Michael, but they are so totally different, um, like chalk and cheese. Um, uh, Michael is, is, is probably like <laughs> the complete opposite. If you look at his background, he's come from, basically he was a welder in a very poor town in mid-America and uh, has been catapulted through on the back of his children into some huge stardom. I think if Joe didn't do what he did, there would have been no Michael Jackson. I'm not one of these people that say, you know, point the finger at the father. He took a very poor family, took a talent that he saw and he gave it to the world. He wasn't forced to work. You can't force someone to work because if you force them to work and they're performing, their performance is gonna be horrible. You may be able to force them to go pick cotton. You may be able to force them to go lift these things, but you can't force them to give a performance. He lived for the performance. It was his adulation. It was his spiritual drug or whatever you wanna call it. He did discuss his childhood with me, um, and I think that he's been quite open about his childhood. In terms of his relationship with his father, I think what the public doesn't know is that he forgave his father for some of the hurt that was caused, and at the end of his life, he was very much on good terms with his father, so I think that a lot of the things, that they happened a long time ago, and, you know, Michael forgave. Michael Jackson was to transform pop music as a solo act, becoming the first African-American singer to gain mass appeal. Thriller, released in 1982, remains the best-selling album of all time. Michael Jackson won 13 Grammy Awards, made boundary-breaking videos, and his slick dance moves were imitated by fans and pop stars around the globe. During his life, he sold an estimated 750 million records, a figure that is likely to rise with the posthumous re-release of his hits. On the 27th of January, 1984, a pyrotechnics accident during the filming of a Pepsi ad resulted in Michael suffering second degree burns to the head. Plastic surgery was required to restore his appearance. Brian Oxman, Jackson family lawyer, claims the medication prescribed to Michael Jackson during this time led to his long-term addiction to painkillers. When he burnt his hair at the Pepsi commercial, he started using painkillers then. He then fell from a stage and broke his leg. He also cracked a vertebrae in his back and those things have caused him terrible pain. I have suffered and dealt with the same kind of medical problem now afflicting my friend Michael Jackson. Because of that and because of our friendship, when Michael's doctor called to ask if I could help, I was glad to intervene. I traveled to Mexico City where I saw for myself that Michael was in desperate need of specialized medical attention. Because of my own experience with addiction to prescription medicines, I was able to make a number of calls in search of the best and most appropriate treatment for Michael. And he is now undergoing such treatment in Europe. Out of respect for his privacy, which I know to be extremely important at this time, I have not spoken publicly about our movements 
or about Michael's exact location. And because of my regard for him and my concern for his health, I will continue to be silent. I will only repeat that I am a friend of Michael Jackson's and I love him like a son and I support him with all my heart. By the end of the 1980s, at the peak of his career, Jackson was crowned Artist of the Decade and was the most famous man on the planet. But despite such triumphs, wild rumors about his private life were swirling. It's been said that Michael Jackson underwent plastic surgery to make himself look more like you. I don't think so. Is that true? No, I, well, I don't think he has. No one's ever told me. He's never told me that. I don't think so. But is it unnerving for you to have a young man that's uh, undergone plastic surgery to make himself look like you? Well, I don't think he's trying to look like me. I really don't. I think he wants to look like what he perceives as makes him feel happy about himself, you know? I don't think he's trying to look like me. I do think he's quite beautiful, though, by the way. You know what the media is like. It's called propaganda. They take anything and they blow it out. We're family. You saw the way we grew up in the two-bedroom house. Family is more important than all the success in anything, and we're always going to hold on to, to that. Their whole thing is to divide and conquer and to separate us. We're family. We're family. We have children. We hurt just like everyone else. Throughout Michael Jackson's life, curiosity and controversy were his constant companions. I was in the room when it happened. <laughs> when I saw it on the camera, I thought, oh, God, that looks really awful. But actually, below the window of the hotel is a ledge uh, that comes out quite a way. And if Michael had held the baby quite firmly anyway, and it was just a gesture of to say, look, look, this is my new child, you know, and then it got, he got absolutely slammed for it. But there, that baby was in no danger at all, ever. And in fact, when we didn't think anything of it until after he'd done it and the fans were all clapping and cheering until, until the next day when um, it came out in the papers and we were, and then I saw the news clip and I thought, well, yeah, that does look a bit um, scary. But, you know, as I say, there was a ledge just underneath. So even if he had have dropped him, <laughs> he would have just gone dropped about two feet. He used to embarrass me how good he was as a father. I mean, I almost like to someone, do something wrong, Michael, please. It's making me look bad. He was very hurt by um, the misreportings in the press, but I think he, his defense mechanism was actually, was not to read them. Don't let it, you know, they can say, they're gonna say whatever they're gonna say anyway, so just don't read, don't get involved with it. And I said to him one day, I said, well, why don't you just sue them? And he said, Mark, if I was to sue everyone that wrote something about me that was untrue, I'd be in court every single day. So it just wasn't worth it for him, so he just decided to let it go. Whether as pop icon or tabloid caricature, the superstar always remained larger than life. But his success as a pop star was almost eclipsed by the endless gossip surrounding his lifestyle. When I first met Michael, he had control in his life. And I think the control started slipping away 2003 onwards when he sank deeper into despair over the false accusations. Please keep an open mind and let me have my day in court. I deserve a fair trial like every other American citizen. I will be acquitted and vindicated when the truth is told. I think that there were a lot of doctors that just barged their way into his life. OK, he got his hands on these drugs. Where did he get the drugs from? Doctors. Can you imagine the horrific outcry if he was out in the street getting 
heroin and he was shooting the heroin into him? Well, he got heroin. It was called Oxycontin. And he got a liquid form that put him to sleep at 5 a.m. Why couldn't he sleep? It took a lot out of him, that. I mean, he, yeah, didn't eat very well, sleeping very badly. And uh, that probably took 10 years off him, I should think. The immense pressure of the allegations led to Michael Jackson's increasing dependency on prescription medication. He was in uh, terrible discomfort during the entire trial proceedings. He's going to go home, recuperate, rest and relax, and he'll be back on Monday, and he's looking forward to being here. He went to the emergency room. And he went to the emergency room this morning, and he was uh, given medications. So he'll be back on Monday, and we all thank you so very much. You take care. Can you imagine the pressure he must have been under? And the pressure was enormous for him. I mean, I mean, of course, we knew that he was innocent of all charges, but, you know, a lot of innocent men have been found guilty, and evidence can fall one way or the other. So the stress of three months of going to court every single day, he looked thin, he looked anemic almost. I mean, he was, it was just... I think that really was probably the worst thing in, in his life as far as his health goes and, and his mental state. On June 13th, 2005, Michael Jackson was found not guilty and completely cleared of all charges. I would like to thank the fans around the world. I would like to thank the fans around the world for your love and your support from every corner of the earth. My family has been very supportive. My brother Randy has been incredible. I want to thank the community of Santa Maria. I, I want you to know that I, I love the community of Santa Maria very much. It's my community. I love the people. I will always love the people. My children were born in this community. My home is in this community. I will always love this community from the bottom of my heart. That's why I moved here. Thank you very much. There was no African American on the jury. There were so many search warrants, so many months of investigation, so many million dollars, and they didn't even get an alcohol charge. They put it in to get something, they didn't even get that. It didn't go to show how guilty he was, it went to show how innocent he is, how clean he is. They went through his house with a fine comb. And um, the lady that brought the charges later went, ended up in jail for fraud. So, you know, I mean, Michael was a victim. Despite all allegations, the King of Pop's lasting appeal was underlined when 750,000 fans of all ages bought tickets for his London O2 Arena concerts. We came from the west of Ireland yesterday, or on Wednesday morning, and we've been queuing since. It was so hard to get the tickets, so I just thought I just took the risk and just come down here and spend the night, and I just don't care. <laughs> When you're looking forward to something, you don't really suffer. That like we had rain, our tent got flooded, but just because we knew that we were going to see Michael, none of that stuff matters. We're here for Michael. We'll do anything. Let me state this. The man came back, sold out a bigger tour than he's ever done in his heyday. It sold out 50 dates, I think something like a million tickets in four hours. So he was very loved and he was very supported. I don't think he has to prove anything to pull it off. He's the legend he is. I mean, Michael Jackson's gonna turn up and do his shows and um, everybody will see that, you know, the next chapter. Set to appear on July 8, 2009, the singer saw the tickets to these shows sell out in only four hours, a testament to his enduring popularity with fans around the globe. The world would never see the comeback he promised. On July 24, 2009, Michael Jackson was a healthy 50-year-old man. The following day, 
he was dead. It saddens me that there are so many people in Los Angeles who, when he died, claimed to be his friend. And yet, where were they? Why didn't they help him? I think we drove him to a lot of things. The world could have done more to appreciate him, to let him know, enjoy yourself, we love you, you're good, you're very good. It's sad that we wanted so much from the man that we kept saying more, 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 rather than saying, hey, no more from you, rest up, enjoy your life. All his life he was transported by private Lear jets to limousines, to entourage, to be quietly and without fanfare transported in the back of a simple ambulance is kind of life's story. Michael Jackson, he was getting ready for a major tour, probably never thought that that was his last day. The world wasn't ready for that to be his last day. So be ready, be prepared every day. Uh, be prepared for your life to end in a positive way because you'd never know. The singer had barely been pronounced dead when the memorabilia market catapulted in value and has since shown no sign of succumbing to gravity. Memorabilia is selling like hotcakes, record shops have been stocking up and Thriller the Musical report record sales. As soon as it arrives in store, within an hour or two it's gone and you're waiting for the next batch. But Elvis and John Lennon are the two obvious comparisons, uh, but it, it's much greater than that. I mean, in those days you didn't have downloads, which are playing a sort of key part this time around, and it would often take a week or two for a single or, a, or an album even to be pressed up and, and sort of distributed out to stores, so everything was that bit slower. But uh, this is just on a different scale. Michael's music sort of cuts across so many different generations as well. Whereas sort of Elvis and John Lennon were seen as sort of older artists for older generations, Michael, notwithstanding the fact he was 50, still did appeal to, to younger fans. While the real financial beneficiaries of his death are yet to be decided, his legacy will undoubtedly become a Disneyland-style franchise that will generate vast sums of money for years to come. There is no innocence, there is no truth. It is absolutely propaganda made so the corporations could profit. There's something wrong with that. There really, really is. Uh, Michael Jackson's life is about selling things records, merchandise, in his life and in his death, he'll still be selling units. This is show business. What would have become a series of London concerts has now become a global cinema and merchandising event, generating vast sums of money for concert promoter AEG Live, Sony, and the many others who stand to profit from the singer's death. Very sad today. It's, um, it's great to be here on the carpet for a premiere, but this is the saddest premiere I've ever been to. And uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna view the, uh, the, the the film itself. I'm just here in support of my other brothers here with the film.
Michael Jackson could never be ignored. The King of Pop was always centre stage. Yet now, there are more questions than ever. Could the family sue him for malpractice? I don't think so, but it'd be interesting. But then again, the guy had a Texas and Nevada license working for Michael. It's like a movie, right? On November 18th, 2009, Michael Jackson's personal physician, Dr. Conrad Murray, the target of the manslaughter investigation, was reported to be planning to sue concert promoter AEG Live for unpaid medical services during his time with Michael Jackson. The way the law works nowadays in America baffles me. I think anybody can face trial for anything, from the doctor to a promoter to a record label. In the world of Michael Jackson, I'll just wait to see it happen. I think I've gone beyond expecting.